welcome everyone to Jesus the Bridegroom Part 2. This is where we get into the New Testament. On Holy Thursday 2009, I was standing in the back of the church in my finest clothes waiting to walk down the aisle and become part of the church and receive the body and blood of Jesus. And as I'm standing back there with all the other candidates and catechumens, waiting for the bells that are our signal to process forward, one of them nudges me and said, this feels like getting married. It is. Little did I know her intuition was right. <laughs> so this class is on how baptism and the Eucharist are like getting married. We've got a lot to go between uh, here and there, so let's get to it. Last time, we looked at God, the husband of Israel in the Old Testament. We looked at how God entered into a marriage covenant with Israel at Mount Sinai. The people washed themselves, abstained from sexual relations, and spoke their vows, promising to obey the Ten Commandments. The covenant was sealed with sacrificial blood, which Moses sprinkled on the altar and on the people to show that God and Israel were now one flesh and blood. Then Moses and the elders climbed up the mountain to eat and drink with God at the wedding banquet. Of course, Israel sins immediately with the worship of the golden calf. Throughout the rest of the Old Testament, Israel is often referred to as the faithless wife. Israel has taken all the good gifts God has given her and squandered them on other lovers. Does this sound familiar? Do we ever do that? Maybe not by uh, literally sacrificing to golden statues, but of course we do. I know that before my Catholic conversion, I believed in God, but I wasn't living for God. God gave me a lot of gifts, and I wasn't using them properly. I was mostly using them to try and succeed in the world, not a bad thing, but it shouldn't have been my first focus, the, the point of my life, and to try and impress other people. Uh, that's a worse thing. You never want to live your life that way. That's squandering gifts on other lovers. And even now, I know I'm perfectly capable of squandering the gifts God has given me. One gift God gives us is love for our fellow human beings. But how often do we pull back? Do we remove ourselves from them? How often do we choose selfishness? How often do we just refuse to get involved? God gives us the gift of peace and rest and tells us he will always be with us and we can trust him. But how often do we give in to worry and that illusion of control that we need to be the ones in charge? That's, uh, that's what yesterday's Feast of Christ the King is there to remind us. That our being in control is an illusion and that Jesus is in charge and he knows what he's doing. Israel is often unfaithful to God in the Old Testament. But God is always, always faithful. He's always calling her and us to greater fidelity to him. He is our king and our Lord, and we give him our all. Let us be a faithful spouse to the one who is always faithful to us and who always provides for us. Let us choose to let his gifts flower within us so that we can be that light of the world, that city on a hill. Then our relationship with God can look like the one in the Song of Songs that we spent a while on last week. The bride is the Shulamite, the peaceful one. She is also a temple of worship and a garden in which God takes delight. A new temple, a new Eden. That is how we look when we have that love relationship with our heavenly bridegroom, our shepherd king. This week, we get to look specifically at Jesus, the bridegroom of the church, and our bridegroom. We're going to look especially at the Gospel of John, which is 
strong on the theme of Jesus the Bridegroom. We'll ask some of the same questions we did last week about Song of Songs, starting with, who is the bridegroom? And who is the bride? This is not as straightforward as it may appear. The answers are going to change a little from last week. Would someone like to read John chapter 3, verses 25 through 30? Now a dispute rose between the disciples of John and a Jew about ceremonial washing. So they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, the one who was with you across the Jordan, to whom you testified, here he is, baptizing, and everyone is coming to him. John answered and said, No one can receive anything except what has been given him from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said that I am not the Messiah, but that I was sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The best man who stands and listens for him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made complete. He must increase, I must decrease. All right, thank you very much. There's a lot to unpack here. What is going on? The disciples of John the Baptist come to him because they are annoyed that John's cousin Jesus has set up some kind of copycat baptism ministry and is drawing away John's crowds. Yeah. They say, hey, this other guy, Jesus, He's baptizing and he's drawing disciples. What are you going to do about it? And how does John reply? John replies, I am not the Messiah. I was sent before him. So clearly testifying that Jesus is the Messiah. You know, what, what are you all upset about? You know, I'm not the Messiah. He is. That's shocking enough. But then comes his real zinger. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. It sounds like a cryptic line. What is John saying to his disciples? Now, first off, these were his disciples. He's not trying to trick them. He's not trying to be coy with them. He's not trying to speak in parables like Jesus did with the Pharisees so that some of the things he said wouldn't be understood. No. These disciples of John know their Hebrew scripture. And they all know exactly what we heard last week. God is the bridegroom, and Israel is the bride. So, John the Baptist says, He who has the bride is the bridegroom. In other words, this man that all of Israel, the bride, is flocking to see, he's the bridegroom. But in the Old Testament, the bridegroom is Yahweh, God himself. And now John the Baptist is saying, it's Jesus. <laughs> Jesus is not only the Messiah, he's God, God the bridegroom. The text does not say how his disciples responded to that statement. I would love to know. <laughs> so, if Jesus is God the bridegroom, and Israel is the bride, who is John? He's the best man. He's the best man. It says right there. My translation said, Friend of the bridegroom, this translates it more clearly, really, as best man. John is saying, I'm not the main character. He must increase, I must decrease. I'm only the best man. My job is to help this wedding move forward. And so John, the best man, prepares Israel, the bride, for the wedding. That's his job. He washes her clean, much like the Israelites were called to wash and get clean before the covenant at Sinai. He calls her to repentance, to renew those wedding vows she originally made before God and to God at Sinai. Now, is John the only friend of the bridegroom? No. Later on in the Gospels, Jesus calls his disciples the friends of the bridegroom. They're part of the bride, but they're also part of the wedding party, helping this wedding to go forward. We, too, can be friends of the bridegroom. We are the bride, but we're also called to help this wedding move forward. When we minister to others, we're being friends of the bridegroom. We're helping the bride of Christ get ready for the wedding.